Oh, there we go. I can see some participant numbers moving. That means people are flooding their way to this Churchill Fellowship information session. I'll wait a few seconds for the miracle that is modern technology to cram all these participants down the pipes. We'll start chatting in just a few seconds. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I won't say all several hundred welcomes, but trust me, you're flooding in, and that's fantastic to see. Okay, we're pretty much up towards 100. Let's kick this off. My name is Adam Spencer. Good evening and welcome. I'm proud to be your host for tonight's Churchill Fellowship Information Session. I want to start by acknowledging I'm currently beaming out to you from land, traditionally under the custodianship of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and welcome you from wherever you are around Australia, in particular a big hello, 21st Australians who are with us this evening. Now, you may know me as the host of the Super Smash Hit podcast, The Churchill Collective, a roaring success, second only to Smartless and Mamma Mia in the Australian market last time I checked. But in all seriousness, that's been a wonderful opportunity for me to sit down with about 20 or so Churchill fellows from every conceivable background. Spoke just the other day to a woman live from Paris in the middle of her Churchill Fellowship, where she's learning from the great kitchens of France how to produce world-class charcuterie. And I'll never forget my discussion in the first series of the podcast with a gentleman who became obsessed with unit pricing. You know how you go to the shops and it says, oh, that'll be 30 cents per 100 grams. You can compare different things, different sizes, all that. And everything in between. It's been an absolute blast. So thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing this evening with us as many of you begin your Churchill Fellowship journey. We are really happy to have well over 100 of you here for our session this evening on education. In this session, you're going to hear two Churchill Fellows speak to their fellowship journey and experience and share helpful advice on how to apply. And you'll learn a little bit more about how their fellowship has continued to support their work going on. Uh, two very different topics that you will hear from tonight as well, from two passionate educators. Uh, it's a great example of how fellowships topics are incredibly diverse and cover such a wide range of topics. So it's okay if you're not sure that your topic fits perfectly under one of our categories. And don't worry about that. Uh, we want to hear from everyone in this process. Throughout the night, if a question pops into your head, Go to the little Q&A icon just there at the top of your screen. Send the questions. There are some questions will be answered mid-session. So if you look back and you think your questions vanished, don't panic. Just go over to the answer tab and you'll probably find it there. And importantly, we will leave the Q&A tab open for about 10 minutes after the videos have stopped tonight. After we say bye-bye, the call continues for 10 minutes. You can go to that Q&A tab look at some of the answer questions and you may well find some things that you're keen to find the answers to sitting there waiting for you just to suck them up, okay? But before we get to our two special guests this evening, you to welcome us on behalf of the Churchill Trust and give an overview of the program and the application process, I'll hand over now to Rachel Sir. Rachel, over to you. Hey, Adam, thank you. And welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people coming in from all over Australia. And I would just like to at this point acknowledge also the traditional owners of the land in which uh, I am, which is Canberra, and that is uh, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. So without further ado, I will share my screen, a little PowerPoint for you guys, and I'll tell you about Churchill Fellowships. So we're remembering Sir Winston Churchill, and as you know, the Winston Churchill Trust, we are here to commemorate and to honour the memory of Sir Winston Churchill. So basically what happened was back in 1965 on Churchill Memorial Sunday, uh, after Sir Winston Churchill passed away, there was an Australia-wide doorknock appeal. And at that time, it was actually the largest doorknock that had ever happened in Australian history. And at the time, there was strong support from RSLs and people were really grateful to Sir Winston for his leadership throughout the World War. 
at that time around $4 million was raised. And so that money has been held in a trust ever since. And since 1965, the Winston Churchill Trust has sent 4,700 people around the world to follow their dreams and to bring back learnings to Australia. And that could also be you. So look, the attributes, what are the attributes of a Churchill Fellow? It's not about how educated you are. And I know this is an education focused session. So yes, you can also be educated, but the beauty of the, the Churchill Fellowship, it's, it's about how passionate you are about your particular topic. And it's a matter of wanting to see things improved in Australia. So if you know that something better is happening overseas that we're not doing in Australia and we should be doing, and you want to learn more, and that that's the crux of what a Churchill Fellowship will be. You're committed to making a real difference. So as I said, there's no qualifications needed. It's four to eight weeks of travel. And what it means is you get to bring back your learnings from overseas and then bring them back to Australia and share your learnings. And it's about improving Australian society. It's really exciting. I know a lot of you guys have got your passion areas within the education sector in particular, and it's very important work. So you've got to be an Australian citizen or a permanent resident to apply, and you have to be over 18 but there is no upper age limit at all to apply. It can't form part of a tertiary study, so keep that in mind. The other thing is we do joint applications for Indigenous and non-Indigenous applicants. So that's really good to know as well. So as I've just said, what is your project? It's got to benefit the Australian community and it should not be available in Australia. And it can't be part of an externally funded project either. But apart from that, we don't set limits on the topic. So that's the beauty of a Churchill Fellowship. You get to pick it. You pick the topic and then you tell us why we should do it. Why? Why do we need to do this? And I can guarantee that you will have a story to tell. You will have a passion that is going to come from within when you present that. So it doesn't actually have to relate to your area of employment, but it can. It can be an interest or field outside of work but it can also be in the area that you work in. So you design your own topic. It's very exciting. We also have some sponsored fellowships on particular topics and in geographic regions. So hop onto our website and check those out because you might happen to live in that particular area. So that's pretty great. And this year, what you do from the 1st of March is when applications will open on our website so our website, churchillfellowships.com.au, and there you can fill out an application form. Uh, if you're interested in seeing what are the questions going to be, you can hop onto that part of the website into the Become a Fellow tab. And in there, we've got an application guide. It's really helpful. There you can have a look at it. It's got all the questions that will be in the application form, which will go live on the 1st of March. So, but the main thing is that you need to speak in plain language, um, keep it really succinct, keep it really plain and don't use jargon and tell us why you want a Churchill Fellowship. At the end of the application, it also includes a little 60 second video pitch. And look, this is not an edited thing. This is very authentic little 60 second grab of why you wanna do your project. The other thing that's really important to think about now is that you'll need two references. You need one personal reference and one professional reference. So your personal reference, they should be able to vouch for your personal characteristics. And then your professional reference should come from your area that you're applying in. So professional area of background. So don't leave that bit to the last minute. Ask your references now to support your application would be my tip for you. So your itinerary, don't try to fit too much in and don't be too anxious about that either. So you should put as much as you can in, but leave space. You'll hear from our upcoming guest speakers and they're going to talk to you about their itinerary and what they did very shortly. But when you list it out in your application, you want to put down where you want to go. That is 
the city, the state, and the country or countries. And make it as detailed as you can because that's what we're going to use to cost your fellowship journey. And once your itinerary is approved, no additions can be made to that. So I know you'll be really interested to know, how can I be chosen? So basically what happens, we have panels and committees in each of the states and territories around Australia. And these panels are people that are from all ranges of sectors and fields. Then what happens is the applications are all shortlisted and we also take into account the references. So about half of the people interviewed are likely to receive fellowships and they're interviewed by the panels. So making it to an interview is a very significant achievement. And then what happens is the selection recommendations are reviewed by our board. They're finalized in September. And then we announce our new fellows. There's a very exciting, very exciting time. So about a hundred new fellows are announced. And then we will have an onboarding event in Canberra where we will bring everybody in to meet, network, give them the tools they need to become Churchill Fellows. Super exciting. So here are the tips that I have for you. Read and address the selection criteria. Use as little jargon as possible and be really clear and succinct. I can't say that word, succinct. Um, and basically why you? How can you convince us that you're the right person to undertake this project? We want you to succeed. We want you to put an application in. So we want you to believe in yourself, take the plunge. We're here to help, you know, just give it a go. So in closing, yes, it's a competitive process, but we do want you to apply. So don't be shy, make your application stand out and just do it. And the small team here in Canberra, including myself, we are very excited to see your applications rolling in from the 1st of March. And that's it from me, Adam. Thank you so much, Rachel. Wonderful presentation. You can now get ready to answer some questions. I'm sure there's gonna be many coming in. Go to the Q&A box right now if you've got any questions about the process that Rachel's outlined there and members of the Churchill Trust will answer those questions for you. As Rachel said, over the decades, 4,700 plus people have been sent around the world. Well, tonight we meet two of them. First up, Jessica Kular Terras. Jessica was awarded the Dorothy and Brian Wilson Churchill Fellowship in 2020 to identify effective language and literacy screening and intervention practices for at-risk students. Such an important issue. She's a senior officer teaching and learning literacy specialist and an instructional coach who has dedicated her entire career to supporting the most challenging and vulnerable students identified at risk for reading failures. Jessica, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Adam. I really appreciate it. So um, thank you for having me today. I'm just going to share my slides now. Here we go. Um, hopefully you can see this. Um, let me know if you can't and then I'll stop. So thanks for the introduction, Adam. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into it. I know we've um, limited in time. and um, So my fellowship project was about effective language and literacy screening and intervention, and especially uh, effective practices to help kids who have um, learning difficulties with reading. Uh, and that has been my field uh, for a long time. So yeah, in my case, my project was directly related um, to my work because I worked in intervention in secondary uh, schools and I faced a lot of issues with, with kids coming into high school unable to read. So that was something that really drive me um, and um, that I wanted to investigate overseas because got so many kids at risk coming into high school unable to read. So part of the planning for my project was to travel across. Um, so I traveled across a couple of countries and I traveled over eight weeks. So quite a, a, a lengthy time to be away. I uh, started with France. I went through Belgium, UK, um, just a couple of weeks or days. And then I traveled across the US and I did five weeks across the US from uh, the um, east to the west coast and ended up in Canada. Uh, and I met 
a lot of the people I met were either professors in university, um, there was parents advocate, I visited schools, classroom, talked to students, parents, teachers, principals, uh, organization that are working in the field of literacy, and especially with reading or tutoring organization. So a vast range uh, of organizational or stakeholders that are, that are hit uh, along the way. In terms of some of the highlights, um, I'm just going to share a couple. So one of the best highlights, I guess, was when I went to Oxford University and met with Professor Kate Nation. If you're in the field of reading and, and literacy, you would know how well reputable uh, and knowledgeable she is. She was wonderful and took me around the whole campus and took time, which I really appreciated in her busy um, schedule to actually um met me meet people and and visit the campus and she took me one night she booked me in for the official dinner at the Oxford Hall at St John College and you can see on the foot on the left hand side where she was wearing her gown um that we had like a three course meal with matching wine I mean being French that was yeah I was in heaven um and meeting amazing people at my table the second highlight, um, that's, and it's something that you probably face, um, and I'm sure Phil, we talked about it possibly, that along the way I met the same people twice or three times. Uh, and I thought that was good because that allowed me to build relationship with those people and get to know them even more. And I've stayed in touch with those people now until, you know, it's been uh, over just under a year now that I just um, came back to Australia. And so those guys that are on the photo, the first time I met them in their, uh, in their town when I went to Columbus. And then after that, I found out just talking to them that they were attending um, an educational conference in uh, the state uh, in Texas. And so we met again um, at the conference later on, um, maybe about three or four weeks later throughout my, uh, my fellowship um, travel. And one that's probably outside the box, um, but, but it is sort of a highlight or not. I haven't lost any bag throughout my eight weeks, um, despite the craziness of airports. Uh, but one thing that happened to me that wasn't wasn't a highlight this time, but I lost a feeling. Um, and I had to go to the dentist in every or nearly every country, in three different countries, because I wasn't staying long enough in every place to, to get it fixed. Um, so I thought that's just um, a nice anecdote, just for you to think ahead, how flexible you have to be. And that's a nice segue to go into this photo. I was trying to think about something that shows how flexible we have to be um, and expect the unexpected somehow. So um, leaving room for anything that could happen. So I, that's one takeaway that I had. Um, I kind of crammed a bit too much when I organized my itinerary and I wish I had lived, left sorry, a bit more room um, to meet people. Because as you meet, when you're at the start of your journey, when you meet people, they start, they often give you and open up their network and send you off to talk to other people they know within the region or the city or town. Um, so often you end up meeting more people than you'd expected, which is great. Um, and often you'll, yeah, you even get access to network you would not have had when you first contact them from Australia. So when one thing I did is when I got a, a rough draft of my itinerary that I sent to the people I wanted to see, I also sent it to them so they would know where I was heading so they could give me all the contact pending which country or which city I was going to. So yeah, just be flexible, bend, and you won't break, and you would last the whole journey. In terms of upon return, so uh, a lot have happened since. So I got back last November, so it's just been under a year. Uh, obviously, writing the report was, was a big milestone and being able to submit it and publish it. Um, a lot of the things that I've learned, uh, I'm lucky enough that it's related directly to my work. So I was able to apply the knowledge uh, directly within the school. So I'm part of a, a education system, the Catholic education of Canberra and Goulburn, and we oversee 56 schools. So I, I'm able to visit school and, and give them the up-to-date research or, or the last little bit that I learned from my experience overseas. I've also been invited to national and state conferences. I'm very lucky to, to, be, um, to be speaking and contribute to events related to literacy. So, and I know that the church has really boosted, um, I guess, uh, my profile my profile in this field. I've also met with 
other key stakeholders that I would never suspect it that I would get an answer from. So like the Australian Government Department of Australia, um, I'm currently based in inner city. So that was, that was an easy meeting. I could go in person to meet with them. I emailed and uh, sent a copy, a printed copy of my report to all the Department of Education across Australia. And I got a um, probably half of positive answers. Some just didn't email, but some actually followed up with uh, online meetings. Um, so that was really, really interesting and very enriching. I was awarded a grant as well. Um, so I went back um, actually within within less than a year to um to go and attend a training in one of the, the cities that I visited in Oregon uh, about um, pedagogy, so direct instruction uh, at the National Institute of Direct Instruction. And a lot of other things, I, I don't wanna go on and on on this one, but really just open doors, like it's it's incredible and, and you don't even suspect what's coming next. Uh, so you have to embrace all the opportunities and just, just say yes to opportunities. I've been working as an expert advisor for the um, AERO, so the Australian Education Research Organization. Um, I got a mention in the latest report of the um, Grattan Institute, Reading Guarantee. So they've been seeking advice and wanted to know some of my case studies. Um, lots of opportunities there for you um, upon your return. And, and recently, actually, I think it helped me, but I just enrolled to start a PhD as well in that field. So I guess I'm just exploring deeper what I've learned through a PhD. Tips and tricks. Um, I'll put three keywords there that really reflect, I guess, um, myself in, in a sense. So resilience, determination, and growth mindset. The first two, I know Rachel talked about commitment um, and showing passion and drive. Uh, for instance, applied for Churchy Fellowship three times, three consecutive years. So that's to show how much I wanted it. And every time I didn't get it, that just made it me want it even more. Uh, and every time I refined, I reached out to other fellows or past fellows, I thought feedback in, in order to just not from the trust, but from other fellows to see whether, you know, whether where I wasn't hitting the mark. Uh, and it could mean that there was a high competition as well. I mean, lots of people apply, so it would be really hard to select um, applicants and to narrow it down to about 100 nationally. Um, so don't give up. Um, keep applying, really, uh, if that's the case for you and it's your second round. Um, you know, it's it's totally doable. Um, the application is fairly succinct, um, but also require you to really... Um, use the keywords being very, um, I guess, thoughtful about what you want to cover because there's such a, a limited space for you to to talk about your your passion that you really need to choose your words well and the reference as well. So I think that's about it for me in terms of tips and tricks. Um, and the gross mindset is just be prepared for the big learning curve. I'm, I'm still, I still haven't recovered. I guess I'm still learning hips. Uh, from all the opportunities that are arising along the way since I got back. So I wish you all, uh, you know, great luck. Um, and if you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. So good luck. Wonderful stuff, Jessica. Uh, people have not hesitated to reach out. Lots and lots of questions came flooding through while <laughs> you were making your presentation there. I've got a couple of questions for you. This is a you made that good point about bending and being flexible to changes. So the conference that you heard about in Texas, had you planned to go to that in the first place or did you find out about that on yeah. the road? Yeah, so that's one of the tips, a tip that uh, was given by past fellows that um, looking at related conferences related, you know, to your field or to your topic and try to include it within your, your travel. Uh, so I was lucky I, I didn't... I didn't have it included in my first itinerary. As I told you, I applied three times, then COVID hit. And then I couldn't travel for three years. And then so I was lucky enough to revise my itinerary and to include it eventually. Um, and that worked out really well. So I kind of, I went to two conferences and I mapped that on my itinerary as a non-negotiable and kind of worked my way around because it has to be a continuous journey. Um, yeah, and it just happened. That's a great tip, actually. Thanks for reminding me. Smart stuff. And Leslie asks a question. Leslie said for the longer tours that people take, you know, eight weeks, 
Did you get extended leave from work, long service leave, leave without pay? What was your situation then? Yeah, that's uh, that's to the discretion of your employee, uh, employer. Sorry, it was a tough negotiation. Um, but my work was really keen for me to learn overseas because obviously it was related to my work. So I had more weight or more weight in my negotiation. I had to take some annual leave and somewhere um. And some of the weeks were paid by my employer as well. So I kind of have it half, half and took some leave as well. So, but yeah, yeah, roughly. So it's really up to negotiated. I don't know, some some workplace would do steady leave as well. I didn't get that. I just had to do half, half um, paid and, you know, annual leave and continue being paid. Yeah, exactly. Like Maddie said in the comments, it will depend on your particular situation make sure you do go through and check those answer questions we've got about 20 questions already there that have been answered during the course of jessica's presentation alone final question jessica most important yes. question for you which country had the best dental system i should say france but that was a disappointment because i'm french but um i would say canada did the best feeling there <laughs> you go mastered. <laughs> Something you never knew you'd need to know when you went. Lovely to speak with you. Thank you, Jessica. We'll come Thank back for the Q&A soon, okay? What a fantastic experience of a Churchill Fellowship. Our next speaker, Phil McGilvray, was award awarded the Park Family Churchill Fellowship in 2018 to investigate innovative methods of equipping teenagers with essential financial skills for life. Oh, Phil, I might be giving you a call after we're done here, my friend. He's passionate about helping people budget, get out of debt, and consistently save money. He's pretty good at helping in this regard, given he's a financial coach and consultant has worked with individual schools and corporations across 30 countries. Phil McGilvray, over to you. Thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, it's hard to believe you're talking about me there, but there we go. Um, guys, I am so excited to be sharing with you tonight. Uh, Churchill Fellowship was one of um, the most amazing experiences of my life. And, you know, they they asked us to come in and share and to speak about the experience. And I would say to everyone that is on this call tonight, uh, j just do it. Uh, you know, you don't need to, like so often we, we think that there are going to be so many other people that are better than us or that our topic isn't a good topic or what have you. But if it's something you're passionate about, you know, will make a difference apply um because it was life-changing for me and uh just so privileged to be able to share it with you here now so what i'm going to do is i'm going to jump to uh my presentation here too so let me just bring that up for you forgot to stop my start my stopwatch so hopefully we're not going over here okay all right i'm hoping we can all see the presentation there um as i said well, Adam said, my name's Phil McGilvray. I'm a financial coach and financial literacy expert. Um, my um, Churchill Fellowship was all about investigating uh, amazing ways to teach our kids about money. Now, I used to be a financial advisor for uh, 10, 15 years, um, but my grandma taught me to budget. I don't know if you can see behind me there. My grandma taught me to budget when I was just uh, 18 years old using physical glass jars and physical money. Ever since I came back from the UK, back 35 years ago, I've been teaching people how to budget, um, save money, get out of debt, you know, start um, achieving life goals and those sorts of things. Um, and I was a financial advisor for 15, 20 years. And it took me that long to realize that financial advisors on the whole don't actually teach, so this is my stopwatch, don't actually teach that sort of stuff. And, um, and so I, I, I left the financial planning world because I wanted to set up my, my own business, which was uh, making practical uh, financial education accessible and understandable for everyone. And so when the, the I was told about the Churchill Fellowship, I thought, yes, fantastic. Uh, this is exactly up my, my street um, because I know that what I, I, I've got and what I want to do will literally change the lives of so many people. Um, and so... Um, that's what I did. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get through. I really admire Jessica who, who applied for it three times. I was one of the very fortunate ones that got through first time round. Um, and I would encourage you like Jessica did to persevere even if you don't get through the first time. Um, okay, 
So let's get on with it. So I was, uh, I had six weeks, I, I was I was away, um, 60 experts. I got to meet with four countries, Australia, the US, Canada, and the UK. Um, it was an amazing six weeks. Uh, it flew by so fast. And uh, as Jessica was saying, you know, it's very, very easy for us to pack. And I um, pack feel, full um, our schedules. Um, and I would certainly say, don't do that. Uh, make sure that you get all the key things in there, but also leave room for connections with other people, extra conferences, all sorts of other things. Whilst I was away, I got invited along to this um, awards night for people that had contributed to the world of financial literacy when I was in Washington, DC. It was amazing to be there and to see all the different things that were people doing. Hadn't been on my agenda beforehand. Um, and so I'm glad I did actually have the time to attend that. Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, all over the world, I stuck to the English speaking world. In hindsight, there's, uh, I found out since it's an amazing program going on in South America, I would love to have attended that. Um, but you know, that that's the way it is. Um, so make sure you do your research before you go along. Uh, and I would say sit down, um, think about who you want to see first and foremost, but then make sure you're doing lots of research as to what sorts of conferences are going on, what sorts of programs are going on, and ask the people that you're going to go and see, well, who else would you suggest I see while I'm in town? Um, and you will be amazed. They'll connect you with all sorts of incredible people. The... Um, Whilst I was there, the highlights for me um, was on the left-hand side there in the purple shirt, you can see is a guy called Dave Ramsey. Now, one of the most beautiful things about the Churchill Fellowship is it, it gives you the platform to actually reach out to people you would never normally reach out to as, you know, an average Joe in the street. So I got to meet Dave Ramsey, who is probably the biggest name in personal finance in the U.S., um, he helps, he and his company help literally millions and millions and millions of people all around the world every year. I get to spend three days with him and his team and learning so much was just amazing. Um, I went to, uh, the next one across here is a, a, um, a workshop that I went to in Delaware in, in the U S and, uh, I actually didn't have big expectations for this workshop, but when I got there, it just blew my mind as to how well these guys, like it was it was a workshop for teachers to teach financial literacy. And this guy in the middle here, um, he he actually had a, a company that he sold for $500 million. And it was a, a shredding, a paper shredding and recycling company that he sold for a huge amount of money. And he put like hundreds of millions of that into this um, into this trust to actually provide financial education programs for, for kids all around the world to teach teachers to teach kids. Uh, it was one of the best uh, events I went to on the whole trip. And it was at a NASCAR a stadium, which was just incredible to see the cars running around on the outside. And then on the right-hand side here, we've got uh, Pete Matthews here, who's the number one personal finance podcast in the UK. I'd been put onto him years and years and years ago. We'd been in contact regularly backwards and forwards. Um, I got to spend a, a day with him and he took me all around St. Ives down in, um, down in Penzance, sort of the south of England, he took me out for dinner to a Thai restaurant, had an amazing time. And the generosity of people as you go around these trips is just incredible. Um, so make sure you leave time for those sorts of things to happen. Down the bottom here, you can see I've got Smelling the Roses. Uh, make sure you do that. The Churchill Fellowship, the guys at the Churchill Fellowship want you to be able to enjoy the trip and to experience some of the sites while you're there. It's not just all work, 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 work. Um, you Because you're going to find that you're away from home for a long time. You do need a little bit of downtime. For me, this was driving through the Forest of Dean in the UK. Um, the trees were freshly new spring, uh, this beautiful sort of uh, fluorescent, you know, green color. And there was, like, you can't quite see it there, but purple bluebells all through the forest. It was just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. So make sure, you know, you take the time to smell the roses. Um Something unexpected, some of the best, uh, some of the events that you go to, um, like the ones you think are going to be the best sometimes aren't. And what happens is the events you, you're just going to because you, you're hoping to get something out of it end up being the best. So make sure that you're, you're popping all sorts of things into your program so that um, you can get the full range of experiences. Um, also, be very prepared that the um, that what you get back, like the information or what you learn through the research and through your time away may not be what you expect. 
it was fascinating to me with from very from early on i started getting this consistent message through that the the traditional mode of financial education is broken um, the way that, that they try and teach it in schools just simply does not work. And one of the big findings I came back with is that the traditional mode of turning financial literacy into an academic subject doesn't work. And that the best way to actually teach our kids financial skills is actually by empowering the parents um, or at least involving parents in the process because financial education is a life skill, not an academic subject. Um, anyway, I could talk to you about that for hours, but you will probably find that the, the the information you come back, I think sometimes we go away with a preconceived idea of what we're going to learn. Um, and actually what you might come back with is completely different to that. So be absolutely open to that for possibly happening. Um, um, since returning to Australia, I've been invited to speak on podcasts all over the world. I've been invited to share findings at conferences. Um, I've created a Money Wise team program that um, continues to evolve. I came back with an amazing workshop from um, the government organisation that just slipped my memory, um, who have had an amazing talk, learn, do program, which is for parents of uh, five to 11 year olds. Um, which I'm, I'm running in, in all sorts of places now. I regularly get asked to speak to school communities, um, close to completing a book on you know the, the 20 things parents need to know about pocket money, how to use it to, to, to raise money-wise kids. Um, regularly contacted by the, the media for an expert opinion on things when there's anything uh, financial literacy related in the news. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, my 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 uh, encouragement to you is just do it. And if you have any questions of me, please don't hesitate to reach out. All of my details, my uh, same with um, Jessica's, is on the Churchill Fellowship Workshop. You just need to go and look for Churchill Fellows. Um, and if you look for me, I'm 2018. Um, but you can also look from my name. So hopefully um, you guys have been encouraged to get in and just do it. Great stuff, Phil. I love your enthusiasm and absolute infectious energy. A couple of questions for you, and then we'll bring Rachel and Jessica back in as well. 60 experts, yes. including some, some serious heavyweights like Ramsey, the goat in your field. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you have all 60 lined up in advance? Did some people refer others? How many of the 60 had you planned? Were there people you planned to meet up with you didn't quite get to? How did that all – what's the final 60 represent? Um, that's a really good question. Look, um, I think, um, no, I didn't have them all lined up. I got introduced to people while I was away, like while I was in Washington, DC, particularly, um, they go, oh, you know, they, they actually took me and walked around the block to these other people. Um, so there was a lot of that going on at conferences. Um, when you go to a conference, you go, uh, I actually met a, a lady there from the Australia, one of the most, the keynote speakers there did an amazing talk. Um, she works for Ernst & Young and done a whole bunch of research for organisations like the Commonwealth Bank and so on. So you get to meet all sorts of people at these conferences. And I would encourage you, if you can, get along to a conference because it's a great way to meet lots of people at once. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I think I missed. So the, the mix, like I probably had organised 40, got to see another 20, something like that. Um, and I didn't, miss, I didn't miss a single one, um, which was very lucky. Um, great stuff. And you went on the Park Family Sponsored Fellowship. Yeah. Did you just apply generally and then the trust steered you to that one or did you specifically spot the Park Family Fellowship as being directly related to your passion? No, no, no. They, um, well, you, when you're filling in the application, you can actually, I, I say, look, I'd be interested in applying for this one as well. But I think, you know, you, could, you apply generally for it. You can tick boxes that yours might relate to and then they actually choose you. Yeah, so Rachel, sir, I'll bring you back in here as well, Rachel. Can you talk us through that part of the process? Some of these are just general church or fellowships. Some are specifically sponsored by individuals or organisations or families and the like. Do you want fellows to go through and find those as well, or does the trust tend to match people up with the appropriate ones geographically in terms of interest, et cetera? Rachel? Yeah, so that's what happens. You guys don't have to worry about that. You can certainly look at it and go, oh, there's one in Tumut. I'm in Tumut but you don't have to match yourself up. That's what we do. And it's quite a, a involved process. And it, we have um, a staff member on team and she's um, really 
all over that. She looks after our sponsors, she looks after the organisations and then she looks at the incoming cohort and she matches them up because, yeah, some of them are very specific, uh, supporting different um, criteria, if you like. We have an auto skills fellowship, for example, and that's specifically for people who are looking at um, the trade of anything to do with automobiles, and that's very specific. So, yeah, you don't have to worry about it, but by all means, check it out and have a look. It's very interesting. Great stuff. To Jessica and maybe to Phil as well, when it comes to filling out your application, uh, I, a lot of people I've spoken to in the course of the podcast said they learned so much about themselves and their interest in actually framing the application. Jessica, there's there's quite a bit of work to really get it right, isn't there? And and, and a lot of it is trimming down the words to make a word limit rather than filling out the space to impress people. Am I right, Jessica? Yes, you are. I, had, I normally write more and then I, then I cut down. Yeah, because you've got a word limit as well. So you have to really carefully choose your words and and the one that has gonna carry the most of your message and the impact that you wanna you, you wanna talk about yeah it requires a a couple of draft um not just a couple a few more <laughs> what about you phil are you as good with words as you are with money what's the application process uh -huh. like and just getting that message right uh yeah like like jessica said you, you really do need to hone it down so you need to think about the most effective way that you're going to um, communicate what you do, how you help people, why you think this is going to be beneficial. And, and it's actually a very good process because it does it does help you think a lot more deeply about why what you do is so important. Um, and I think in that event, you, know, you, you need to get it concise, so you need to hit the key points. And uh, it's a very good process. Rachel, part of the application is you can submit a one-minute video uh, in, mm -hmm. You mentioned you had no need to edit it up too much or anything. You, you, you don't want a massive sort of TikTok, super photoshopped, Hollywood produced AI, CGI. You're not, you're not being judged on your skills as a filmmaker, are you? Absolutely not. Um, so it's 60 seconds and it's it's meant to be very authentic. So we have had people, you know, doing it from their backyards, from their kitchens, from our horseback, you know, depending on what the area of passion is. But we don't want anything edited. We, we don't want that. I think more and more, actually, it's funny you should talk about AI and CGI. More and more, I feel like we um, are leaning towards authenticity. A little bit uh, rugged without video is actually better. So, yeah, don't stress about the video. Just want you. Just want you. There's an anonymous question here. This might be a good one for you, Phil. It's on the topic of money. Did presenters find they needed to cover expenses that were not originally budgeted for? Did you find yourself significantly out of pocket? It would be a bit ironic, Phil, if you'd gone massively into debt doing your uh, <laughs> financial literacy uh, no. fellowship. Yeah, no, no, that's right, mate. No, um, no. The uh, What the Churchill Fellowship provide is actually a very generous, um, is actually very generous into the daily allowance that they give you. And so... There was no way in the world we, you know, would have gone into debt in or, or had to fork out a lot ourselves. Now, I will say, and I meant to say this in, um, my wife actually came across and joined me for for some of the Canadian part of the, the trip. Um, we paid for her to come across, of course. Um, but, you, you know, um, in most cases, the rooms that we had already, you know, were already covered by the Church of Fellows. So, just this, you know, so it was great. And, um, but no, you I think that what the Churchill Fellowship provide is actually incredibly generous in terms of a daily allowance and in terms of covering all your accommodation costs and those sorts of things. So no, nowhere near. Great stuff. I'll bring you in here as well, Rachel. We're ticking up towards almost 50 questions that have been answered by you and the team and pushed into the answered section. Uh, a lot of these questions you're getting asked, Rachel, there is an FAQ section um, and an application guide on the Churchill Trust website that probably handles a lot of these formality questions, doesn't it? Well worth checking out? Definitely, definitely. And, um, yeah, just have a look through, sift through it. And if you have any, like, questions that aren't on the website, you can always shoot through uh, an email to our team and we're very happy to answer them. But we've tried to think as many questions as we can and put it up there to be helpful. Mm. Fantastic. Well, as we wrap it up, we've pretty much got through it all now. Jessica and Phil, I'll get one final statement from you to our prospective applicants. Jessica, what do you say to the almost 150 people who are online at the moment? 
just do it. Phil said it so many times. I would just reinforce that. And I know I have a friend who's attending right now and I've been pushing him to apply because he's got the right profile. Um, and two of my friends have actually applied. Um, one got it last year. So just do it. Um, do it. Don't hesitate. And reach Phil. out to us if you need any advice. I'm more than happy to yeah. answer or review application or stuff. Yeah. Very generous of you, Jessica. Phil, what's your message? Uh that it is an experience of a lifetime. The Churchill Fellowship wants you to enjoy the trip. It's not like you go there and you're going to see every single person you can see and you're going to come back exhausted. They actually want you to enjoy the process. And they they, te they treat you like rock stars. Like, it's just amazing. The team at the Churchill Fellowship are so kind, so helpful, so thoughtful. Um, and as, as Rachel just said, you know, they're not looking for these videos that are polished and amazing. And that's that just brings it back to who they are and who they're looking for. Um, so I said earlier to, not in the, my presentation, but as we was just meeting before we, we got on here, um, I didn't realize how badly I wanted this until I thought I'd bombed the interview. And then when I found out I had got it, I was so excited. And I think there's a real risk of, probably most of the people on this call having this imposter syndrome where they think they're not good enough or the topic's not good enough. Um, just apply, just apply. If you care about what you do and you think it's going to make a difference, just apply. Yeah. Thank well said, Phil. And as Jessica pointed out, if you apply and miss out, don't be afraid to come back again. Lovely message here from Helen. Please say hello to Adam Spencer for me. Last century, I was the recipient of the 1999 gold banks here at the ballroom in Melbourne for empowering young people to be competent caretakers of the planet for the next millennium. I remember, Helen, the Banksia Awards are probably Australia's preeminent environmental um, and ecological awards. Adam was the MC on the night. Helen says, I was totally unprepared to be known for the award. I've never really followed up on it or used it for anything until now, but thinking it is an encouraging sign that Adam's on this presentation. Well, best of luck, Helen. You make sure you get in there and fill out an application. Thank you so much, Jessica, Phil, Rachel, and our hundreds of attendees online. If you have been inspired tonight, Go ahead right now and start to do the work required to apply for a fellowship. Don't leave it too late. You might want to attend another one of the information sessions that run over the next couple of weeks. If we didn't get to your question, or if you think of questions after this session is finished, you can contact us directly by the Churchill Trust website, churchillfellowships.com.au, and be sure to check out the FAQ section on the website that I talked about. Many of your questions will be answered there. And this Zoom will remain open up until 7.30. For so about another 12 minutes or so, I strongly recommend you quickly scroll through the now almost 60 questions and comments that have been answered to see if we've covered off on anything else of interest to you there. Thanks for your time. If you do apply, best of luck and good night.